Hello guys, here we are again. Let's start with our second lecture for statics. Today we're going to be dealing with Cartesian vectors, addition and subtraction of Cartesian vectors, position vectors and force vectors, and dot product, basically. And maybe at the end we're going to do something else, we'll see. So for today, represent a 3D vector in Cartesian coordinate system, find the magnitude and coordinate angles of the 3D vector and add vector forces in 3D space. 3D is the worst thing that students do. They always perform bad in 3D. Uh, reason for that, I don't know. Why do we have to work in 3D? Why do we have to work in 3D? Because, you know, regardless, people say that there are not three dimensions, but 12 dimensions or 13 dimensions or 11 dimensions. I personally have problems with imagining more than four, which is four one, which be the time. But uh, the world, as we perceive it, is three-dimensional. So we have, if you have to select a coordinate for one point, only two that two two distances are not gonna locate the point in the space. You need three. So that's why we are working with three dimensions. So applications, for example, you have that type of situation, like in this problem and you want to calculate the force in each one of those cables, well, those forces in the cables, guess what? They are not going to go in the plane, unless they, you consider inclined planes and there will be a plane. But not of, all of them are going to be in the same plane. So all of the problems basically uh, are three-dimensional, tridimensional. So then why do we study two dimensions if all the problems are 3 d well, because sometimes you can simplify a 3D problem in a 2D problem, and you do that a lot of times in engineering. Look at that, for example, electrical engineers. You are always complaining about electrical engineers and statics. Why do I have to take this class? Why do I have to take this class? There you go, there's an application for electrical engineering. You have this uh, tower, which by the way, was a really, or it is a really elegant solution in engineering, that type of antennas because this support here is what is called a ball and socket support and we will discuss that when, when I reach the point of support reactions I'm going to touch this point again because that's a really elegant solution but you, once again you have to calculate those tension in those cables that are holding the antenna in place so let's start with a unit vector I know you know or you are supposed to know the definition of a unit vector because you took physics so if I ask you right now or I let your TA to ask you right now, what is a unit vector? Maybe you're not going to answer because you're going to be shy with him. By the way, when I go to the classroom, you better answer to me. Uh, but if I say a unit vector, I know the answers. I say a vector of magnitude 1. And I'm going to say no. What? Yes, it's a vector of magnitude 1. Yes, that's a vector of magnitude 1. But that doesn't make it a unit vector. Because if I have a unit vector of 1 kilogram acting in that way, that's not the unit vector. That's a vector of magnitude 1 kilogram acting in that direction. So that's not the definition of unit vector. Now, what is a mathematical definition? Well, if you want to define a unit vector in the direction of the vector A, a unit vector, it can be the vector divided by the magnitude of the vector. Yes. But that doesn't tell me also what is a unit vector. Well, characteristics of a unit vector might define what a unit vector is or describe it. Magnitude. It's one. But you just all told me that it's not one. No, this is not what I told you. What I told you is that if you have a vector of magnitude of one kilogram acting in that direction, that, that's not a unit vector or one kilogram or one, one pound to make it weight or one newton. But the magnitude has to be one. But the other characteristic is dimensionless, it's unitless. So when I say one newton acting in that direction, that's not a unit vector anymore because it has a unit. Okay, the second characteristic has to be unitless or dimensionless. And the third characteristic is that it has to point in the same direction as the original vector. So the unit vector in the direction of A has a magnitude of 1, doesn't have any direction, and goes in the same direction of the point A. That's why we can use the unit vectors in order to represent the direction of the vectors. And the unit vectors always use IJK. 
Now, let's try to do this thing. I know you took this in physics. Let's just review it really quick. The way uh, you say consider a box with size AX, AY, and AZ, and you have a vector A acting there. Well, the important thing about this is the components. The component of this is going to be AX in I, AY in J, and AZ in K. And look at the 90 degree angles where they are located at 90 degree and 90 degree here. Why? Because this is the faces, these are the faces of that box. The vector A can be defined as the coordinates in those directions. The component in X in the direction I, the component Y in the direction J, and the component Z in the direction K. Now you have two different things. You have the director angles, and we're going to discuss that in two slides, and you have what is called the projection. Projection is just that, getting that vector that is in this way and getting like the shadow of that vector over the plane that you're looking at the projection. If I'm looking at the projection of the vector A over the plane XY, it's going to be the shadow that that vector projects on that plane, so it's going to be this value A prime. If I'm looking, uh, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, go faster than I should. Okay, now you have the different thing, which is that's the projection. Now you have the direction orientation vector via the cosine directors angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma are the angles measured with respect to the x, y, and Z axis. The ranges go between 0 and 180. Those are called direction cosines. And the director co and the cosine of the angle alpha, which is this one, is just the component in X divided by the magnitude of the force. The, the cosine of beta is the component in Y divided by the magnitude of the force. And the cosine of gamma is the magnitude of the, the component of in Z divided by the magnitude of the vector or, or the force in A. This, copy this, or highlight that if you want to, because this, this material is posted. These angles are not independent. They must satisfy the following equation, cosine square alpha plus cosine square beta plus cosine square gamma equal one. And you can prove that really easy. Why? Because if you put this in here, this in here, this in here, and you square it, at the end you're going to get AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared, which is A squared divided by A squared is 1. The unit vector then is going to be cosine alpha I plus cosine beta J plus cosine gamma K. What is the advantage of using this? Well, the advantage of using this is that if I want to get the direction uh, and the vector defined, and I have the magnitude, and I have the unit vector. I just multiply the magnitude times the unit vector, and I get the vector. This is what I was showing before. You see, alpha is the angle that that vector makes with the x-axis. But notice that that angle is inclined, okay? It's inclined. What I do is I go to one of the corners of the classroom, and I imagine the vector coming out from the corner, and I, I suggest you to do the same thing. And then I measure if the angle comes in this direction, I measure the angle between this vector or this force and the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis respectively. Do that. So alpha is the angle that A, in this particular case, forms with the x-axis. Beta is the angle that the vector and the y-axis form, and z, and A gives you gamma. If you look at now these drawings here, now you can see why cosine of alpha is AX divided by I. This is the hypotenuse. Even if you don't see it, this is the hypotenuse. Why this is the hypotenuse? Because look at the 90 degree angle where it is. So that means this is one side, and this is the other side. So this is the hypotenuse. Cosine of this angle is adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Look at this case. 
cosine of this angle is adjacent divided by hypotenuse, and this is the easiest way of seeing, the easiest one, to, the easiest one to see. But if you want the cosine of this angle is adjacent divided by hypotenuse. If you have the vector in Cartesian form, the three vector, which is the way I suggest you honestly to work these problems always, the composed vector in Cartesian form. Uh, so if you have the vector in Cartesian notation now, it's a lot easier to process because you just add the components. If you want to get a plus b, it's just whatever goes in i together, whatever goes in j together, whatever goes in k together. So just add these terms, add these terms, and add these terms. Or if you want to subtract the same thing, just subtract this minus this, this minus this, this minus this. That's what it says there. And if you have three, four, five, six, seven vectors, it's the same. It's just adding or subtracting components. Sometimes 3D vector information is given as magnitude and coordinate direction angles. If you have the magnitude and the coordinate direction angles, remember coordinate direction angles are going to define cosine alpha, i, cosine beta, j, cosine gamma, k, multiplied by the magnitude is going to be the vector, or magnitude and projection angles. When you have the projection angles, then you have to start working with trigonometry in order to solve that. And you should be able to use any of those methods in order to express a vector in Cartesian notation, notation IJK. For example, let's let's do an example. And don't don't be uh, don't bother too much if you can't see that drawing because I'm gonna make that drawing bigger now. But uh, the example says, given two forces F and J, F and J, F and G. I'm sorry. Uh, are applied to this hook here. The force F is shown there and it makes a 60 degree angles with the X Y plane and then you have this other 45 degree between that and that line and the X angle and the only thing that you know about the force G is that it's pointing up but you know the magnitude of uh, the magnitude of that force is 80 pounds and alpha is 111 and beta is 69.3 Find the resultant of those two forces, those two forces, and express it in Cartesian notation form. How are we going to solve that problem? Well, in the same way that we are going to solve every one of these problems, we're going to express each one of the vectors in Cartesian notation, either geometry, trigonometry, or just the definition of alpha, beta, gamma, and then we're going to add the components. That's it. Let's do it. This is the problem. That's what I told you that. The force G, I'm not showing it here for now because I'm going to work with the force F. I'm going to try to show the components of the force F first. If this is the force F, the components of the force F is going to be this component here that goes in X, this component here, which is positive, by the way, this component here that goes in Y and is negative. Why is negative? Because it's going to the left. And this component here that goes in Z and goes up and is positive also. Well, if I ask you right now, what is the what is the component in uh, of the force F in the z-axis, so the component in K? It's really easy because you already have this angle here, you see? That angle here, and I have the value of the force F. I can calculate this. The 90 degree angle is here because this is in Z, and the other one is the plane here. So you have the angle in this part. And then I can say that this is sine, right? So sine of 60 is going to be opposite divided by hypotenuse, and I solve for this one. But what about these two? Well, I can solve that immediately, but if I find the projection of the vector f with the plane x, y, remember the shadow that this projects over the x, y plane is going to be this line here. Can I find that line? Of course I can, because then I have this leg this leg and the hypotenuse, and this angle is 60 degrees. So this value here, this value here, is not going to be other thing if we work with the first triangle, the, the top one, let's, top, let's work with the top one because uh, that's what I told you before. This angle here is 60 degrees, this is 90 degree. this is 100, this is Fz. How much is Fz? Well, Fz is going to be 100 sine 60, and that's 86.6, .6, and it's positive. First component done. Now the second part, 
first I have to find the projection here. And in order to find that projection, I can work with the cosine of 60. And I say cosine of 60 is this projection, which I call f prime divided by 100, which is the hypotenuse. Then I can calculate f prime. Now, if I want to find fx and fy, these two, I go to the plane xy. I have f prime, which is 50, and I have I can calculate fx and fy because I can say cosine 45 is fx divided by f prime or sine 45 is fy divided by f prime. fx is 50, cosine 45, why 50? Because f prime is 50 and fy is 50 sine 45, which is negative, remember I told you because going to the left it's going to the left in this direction. And then you have Fx, Fy, and Fc. There you go. We have the first force. Force F is defined. The other point that we have to define now is the force Fg. If you want to copy, copy. But remember this material is posted. The idea is that I posted before class so you can come and you can take notes on top of your slides or your on top of your copies. Okay, now the next step is work with the force G. Do you remember what we know about force G? Uh, one of the things that you have to do, guys, when you solve a problem is read the problem. Usually you try to solve the problem without even reading what the problem is asking you to do. So what do we know about the 4G? It says that it's pointing up, has a magnitude of 80 pounds, and has alpha equal 111 and beta equals, equals 69.3. Well then we can do it because we have alpha and we have beta and if they don't mention gamma it's because gamma is zero, right? I'm gonna ask again. I say because gamma is zero, right? No, it's not right. Gamma is not zero. You can't assume that because somebody doesn't tell you anything is because it doesn't exist. Remember when I told you copy this, that this is important? When I told you copy that, it's because gamma is related with alpha and beta through this equation. So you use this equation and from this equation, you say cosine squared alpha, which is this, cosine squared beta, which is this, and cosine squared gamma equal one. So you can solve for gamma, and gamma is 30.22. Remember, always has to be smaller than 180, that angle. In case that you have two, I mean, you can have two solutions if you use a calculator sometimes. So gamma is 30.2, so we have alpha, beta, and gamma, and we have the magnitude. Remember, magnitude times cosine alpha i plus cosine beta j plus cosine gamma k. That's what we do. That's what we do. So because we can calculate the coordinate directors, then we have g in this case is going to be 80 times the unit vector in the direction of g. But the unit vector in the direction of g is what I told you before, cosine alpha i plus cosine beta j plus cosine gamma k. Now you put all together. You multiply that by the magnitude, and then you get g. What is now to do? What What is the problem asking us to do? Who remembers that? Anyone remembers that? Find the resultant force. And how do we find the resultant force? Well, what we did so far is the composing f or expressing f and g in Cartesian notation. Now we get the resultant by putting F, putting G, and notice this. Be organized. Be organized when you solve your problems. Look at the size of the class. Right now there should be like 200 students in this classroom. Imagine what is for me or for your TA, depending on what is the activity that we are doing, grading 200 uh, papers. That's a lot, right? So the more organized you are, the less the possibility of we missing something that you did. 
So try to be organized and it's also the less the possibility of you messing up your problem. So I put the I on top of the I, the J on top of the J, and the K on top of the K. And if I don't have a J in this case, it doesn't matter, I put zero here. And then I put a line, add the map, and add the vectors here. The resultant force is gonna be this minus this, remember the signs, minus this plus this, and this. Now, if I not need to know the magnitude of the resultant force, how do you do that? Very good, you take the square root of the square, the summation of the squares of the components, so this is square plus this is square plus this is square, and square root of that. And you have, if I need the direction of the resultant force, well, the direction, remember, is expressed through the unit vectors. And the unit vectors for these are what? The unit vectors for these are this divided by the magnitude, that's the cosine of alpha, this divided by the magnitude of the force, that's cosine of the resultant, and this divided by the magnitude is going to be cosine of gamma. That's it. Okay, the second part that we have to deal today with is... Uh, Position vectors, and that's another way that you have to represent a vector uh, in Cartesian coordinate form by using unit vectors, uh, position vectors. So let's use position vectors and let's represent forces by using position vectors. Position vector, what is a position vector? You remember last lecture that I asked you, uh, what are these following um, quantities is a scalar? One of them was position, and I say no. Of course, it's not because of that. You see, the position vector R, in this particular example, gives you the position of B with respect to A. That means that implies a direction. And I know you know this because you learned how to calculate that. If you want to calculate this position vector, it's just the coordinates of B minus the coordinates of A. And that's exactly what the position vector is coordinates of B minus the coordinates of A, or tip minus tail all the time. XB minus XA, coordinate of B minus coordinate of A, coordinate of B minus coordinate of A, and same thing for Z. Always capitalize here big letters. Why I say that? Because that's the number one error in my test. People mess up with that. Force vector directed along, along a line, well, if I have this force along the line, I can get the unit vector multiplied by the magnitude of the force, and I get the force. But how can I get the unit vector? Because the unit vector is dimensionless. So if I can get the unit vector of the position vector, it's going to be the same unit vector as the force. That's basically what we do. So we find the position vector AB. We got the magnitude of the position vector AB, divide both of them and get the unit vector AB. And there you go, I just multiply that by the magnitude of the force now, and I get the force in Cartesian notation. Let's do this example. Sometimes I put this example here in class, like a class activity. They say, you have five minutes to do that. And everybody start freaking out, wow, five minutes, oh, is it possible in five minutes to do that? And you don't even read. I'm just asking you to express the force dA. That's it, dA in Cartesian vector form. So what are you going to do? Find the position vector dA and the unit vector in that direction by dividing this by the magnitude of dA and multiplying that by 400, basically. Let's do that. We need the coordinates of the point A and the coordinates of the point D. Coordinates of the point D here. If this is the 0, 0, 0, my origin, the coordinates of the point uh, D are going to be 2 in this direction, which is x, 6 in this direction, which is y, and in z is 0 because it's over the plane x, y, 2, 6, 0. And the coordinates of the point A, well, the point A coincides with the Z axis, so it's going to be 0 in X, 0 in Y, and 14 in Z. If I have to calculate now the position vector dA, I just subtract this minus this. 2 minus 0 is 0, 6 minus 0 is 6, 
and 0 minus 14 is that, and then I get the position vector. Any question? Not to me, but you can ask to the TA. No questions? Well, guess what? That is wrong. And I'm going to be doing this during the whole semester, okay? I'm going to be messing up. I'm going to be making you copy. And then I'm going to tell you that it's wrong. Why is wrong? In the previous slide, I just explained it to you. DA, when you do the position vector DA, you have to subtract tip minus tail. Tip, the tip of the arrow minus the tail of the arrow. And this is the A, and I subtracted actually D minus A, I subtracted the tail minus the tip, and that is incorrect. That you don't do. You do tip minus tail. So that means that the result is going to be the basic, the same result, but the, all the signs are going to be opposite signs. So I put A, I put D, I subtract A minus D, and then I get my position vector DA. Once I get the position vector DA, I just divide that by the magnitude of the position vector DA. What is the magnitude of the position vector DA? Square root of 2 squared plus 6 squared plus 14 squared. And I divide that by this, and I get the unit vector. And I multiply that by 400, which is the magnitude of the force. And I get my force. That's it. End of the problem. Guys, be really careful with that part of tip minus tail because I really hate when I start grading a test and I see that. Because I do that in class so many times that you should learn it by now. So don't do it. Okay, let's check this problem out. Uh, this is a nice problem. And let's read it first. It says, determine the position x, y, 0, x, y, for fixing the cable B, A, so that the resultant of the forces exerted on the pole is directed along this axis from B towards O and has a magnitude of 1 kilonewton. Also find, what the is this? How I'm going to do this problem if I don't have the value of F3 and I don't have the value of the location of that point? That means I don't have the position vector, I don't have the force. Oh, wait a second, but I know, I know that the resultant force goes vertical from B to O. You see that? So basically, I know that that's a, that's a given piece of information. So I know the resultant force, and be very careful with that because it goes from B to O, it's negative Z. I know F1 completely, well, I know the magnitude and I know the location of everything, so that means that I can put this in Cartesian formulation also. I know F2 also, the magnitude and the location, and we have to calculate F3, and we have to calculate the position and everything else. Okay, how do we do that? Same procedure that always we are going to do. They compose the forces F1, F2, F3 and their components, in other words, express it in Cartesian notation. Summation of the forces in X, Y, Z, make the summation equal to Fc, so to the resultant force. Establish three equations and three unknowns. What are three equations and three unknowns? Because that's what we have, basically. Three equations in X, one in X, one in Y, and one in Z, and solve the system. Well, some cases the system is a system, but you don't have to solve it with the calculator because all the values are going to be direct, directly given to you. So let's start. I need the coordinates of this point and the coordinates of this point if I'm going to start expressing the force. Why? Because the first thing, remember, is finding the position vector of the force 1. That means we're going to have the position vector B, whatever this point is, and divide by that by the magnitude of that distance, multiply that by the magnitude of the force, and express the force in Cartesian notation. Coordinates of this point, negative 2, 0, 0. Why? Because I go negative 2, this is the positive direction for x, so I go back 
that means negative, and it's exactly on the point A. What are the coordinates of this point? Well, I'm exactly over the Z axis, meaning X is zero, Y is zero, and Z is three. And now if I want to calculate the position vector, I'm gonna subtract this minus this. Nope, I'm gonna subtract this minus this because it's tip minus tail. Negative two, zero, zero, minus zero, zero, three. This is the position vector of the force one. I divide that by the magnitude which is the square root of this square plus this square, and multiply that unit vector by 500, and I get the first one. Now, this is one way of doing the position vector. I don't know if you learned this other way, but I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna try to teach it to you right now, and it's a lot. Once you get a hold of that, when you get, when, once you get used to that, it's really easy to do, and it's faster. So you can start, subtracting coordinates, this minus t, this, so you can get practice, but do this other method and check it by this other method. When I'm telling you to calculate the position vector, there's something that I call running the vector. Remember, when you subtract coordinates, you go from tip minus tail, but when you run the vector, I'm gonna start from the tail of the vector, from this point, I'm gonna go from this point to this point, following the axis. So if I go from this point, to this point, following the axis, the first thing from this point to there that I have to do is coming down, three, that means negative three in Z or in K, that means negative three in K, and going back two in X, negative two in X. That's why you have it, you see? Negative three Z, negative two I. There you go. That's the position vector. Now let's work with F2. Now, I'm gonna need the coordinates of this point also. And the coordinates of that point now in X is one, in Y is negative two, and in Z is zero because we are in that plane. And then once again, if I want the position vector for the force two, I subtract this minus this, which is one minus zero, negative two minus zero, zero minus three, and you have that. Or if I run the vector, remember, I start from this point and I go to this point, so I go, negative three in Z, negative two in Y, and positive one in I. Positive one in I, negative two in Y, negative three in Z. In K, you can do it in that way if you want to. Get that divided by the magnitude of the position vector, which is the square root of this square plus this square plus this square. This is nine, 14, 13, nine, 13, 14. And divide that, get the position vector, multiply that by 400, and get the force two. So now we have the force one and we have the force two. I know that when students, a lot of students try to solve this problem, then they go and they try to find the position vector for F3 in terms of X, Y. That's over super complicating the problem. So what, what else do we know now? We know that this is F1 and we know that this is F2. This is what I was telling you, see? I put I, J, and K, and yeah, if I is zero, I put it there, just for not messing up. Now, what is F3? Do you know anything about F3? Yes, we know. We know that we don't know anything. That's something. Then we can express F3 as F3X in I, F3Y in J, and F3Z in K. And I know something else. I know that when I add these three forces, now it comes a piece of information that we had from the statement. That is saying that the resultant force is acting upside down. And be really, really, and once again, really careful with this, because the result says one kilonewton. But all these, these forces are expressed in newton. If you put one kilonewton here, when you add these two, then you're gonna have the wrong result, even though the procedure was correct. And you know, that really, really, that's really slain that you did the whole problem and you're gonna mess up in that way. So basically, when you add all of these, this is gonna be zero, zero, and 1,000, correct? I say correct, and you say no. Why? 
because it's not zero, zero, and 1,000. It's negative 1,000 because it's acting downwards from B to O, which corresponds with the negative direction of C. Now, this is the system that I was telling you that we have. Everything in I, when I add them up, is zero, because remember, this is the resultant force. Everything that I add in J is zero, and everything that I add in K is zero. When I put them together, I have negative 277 plus 106 plus F3X equals zero. So from here, I have F3X directly. From J, I add them up also. And from K, I also add them up. From here is directly F3X, F3Y, and F3C. There you go. If you're copying, copy. So basically now we have uh, the force, X, Y, and Z, the, the force three. If we want the magnitude of that, we just take the square root of this square plus this square plus this square. We add them up and we calculate the magnitude. If I want the direction of this force expressed in alpha, beta, and gamma, well, this divided by this is gonna be cosine alpha, this divided by this is gonna be cosine beta, and this divided by this is gonna be cosine gamma, that's it. What else do we need to calculate? We need to calculate X and Y, that we don't have that. But remember, eh, you remember when you have the little triangles in the forces, and we were dealing with that in last class, and you say, oh, this little triangle, this part, this corresponds to the horizontal component of the force, and this corresponds to the vertical component of the force. We can do the same thing here also. And I can say that this force is three, is this the component in y in, in z in y and in x but at the same time it's also uh, the geometry three two and two because they are related with the same unit vector both of them so basically i can establish these equations and say that x is related to z as the x component of the force is related to the z component of the force and I know C, and I know X, and I know F3Z. So I can solve for X, and I can calculate my value for X. Or I can say here, Y, this, this Y coordinate is up to the Y component of the force, as three is up to the Z component of the force. And I can solve for Y. And then I can solve for my two unknowns. So, you can do the other way, you can do the long way and try to match it and do the 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 inverse of, you know, work it backwards and try to get the position vector from the components and the big quadratic equation. But it's, this is a lot easier, so try to do it like that. Okay, another thing that we have to touch a little bit is the dot product. And um, the dot product, is used for several things, calculating projection angles and determining the angle between two vectors. So let's do that. Let's see that. Application, well, if I want to know how much is the angle that works between this force and that pole or between the two forces or how much of this force is acting on that pole, those are all effects of uh, or uses for dot product. If I want to know how much of this force is acting in the direction or how much of the force is acting perpendicular to the direction. That's another application of dot product. What is the definition of dot product? Well, if you go to the mathematical definition, the dot product is defined as A dot B is magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between the two vectors. That's basically it. And remember that angle has to be the smallest angle between the two vectors. So it's between zero and 180. Oh, wait a second, but that means that there's another definition also of dot product, remember? That is the I component times the I component plus the, P, the J component dot the times the J component plus the Z component times or the K component times the K component. What are the characteristics of dot product? Well, the characteristics of the dot product is that it's a scalar, the result. 
And what are the units of the dot product? Well, the units of the dot product are the multiplication of the units of each one of the vectors. That's it. So if this vector, if this vector is meters and this vector is newton, well, it would be meter newtons or newton meters. The dot product. Definition. If you apply the definition, is a times b cosine of the angle between the two? Obviously, if you are saying a dot j, that's going to be zero because it's going to be magnitude of i one times magnitude of j one times cosine of the angle between i of j. What is the angle between i and j? Ninety degrees, right? Cosine ninety degrees zero. So when they are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. When they are parallel, the dot product is one. Basically, what you are doing when you do the dot product is applying the distributed property of the multiplication with respect to the addition. Why? Because you say a a x i b x i. But then when you say a x i b y j i cross j i dot j is zero, and i dot k is also zero. So that's why the only components that are effective are, are Ax, the same components, i with i, j with j, and k with k. And the result is going to be a scalar. You can find the angle then by getting this, which is the dot product, vector-wise, and divide by the magnitude of a, and divide by the magnitude of b. Because that's the other definition, right? This is one of the definitions, and the other definition is magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine of the angle. So you take the inverse of the cosine, pass the, the other dividing, and that's it. And let me tell you that you have to use the dot product a lot, because every time, every time that you say, oh, wait a second, what is the value of this side? Well, this side is a cosine of the angle. What you are doing is a dot product. a cosine of the angle multiplied by the unit vector. But the unit vector in this direction is 1. If you are using a, the x, y axis, that's why you have used it. Every time that you apply that property, you are using unit vector. So let's do a, a small example like this one, and just to fix the knowledge. And let's see what happened here. The example is. You have this force acting on this pole, and you will have to find the angle between the force and the pole, and also how much of that force is acting along the pole. In other words, the magnitude of the projection of the force along the pole. Angle between these two, and also the magnitude of the force projected on the pole. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I have the vector here. But that means that I need the position vector also, OA. And notice that I say OA, not AO, because when you do the dot product, the two vectors have to be joined by the tail. Okay? And I have to find the position vector, get the angle by doing the dot product between the force and the position vector. And find the magnitude by applying the properties of the position, the dot product. That's it. So let's start from the beginning. The position vector OA, if we have to run the vector, would be in X, from here to here. How much is that? 2, 2. In Y, from here to here. How much is that? 2. So it's going to be 2, 2. And now in Z, from here to here. How much is that? No, it's not 1 negative one. So it's going to be two, two, negative one. That's the position vector. I have the force. Yes, I have the force here. Do I need the magnitude of the position vector? Probably. Let's calculate it because I want to calculate the the position vector, the, the unit vector if I want to. This is the force. Now, the force in magnitude, I'm going to need it. Why? Because remember the dot product definition is magnitude of one times magnitude of the other. 
So the magnitude of the force is the square root of this square plus this square plus this square. Then you have the magnitude of the force. And now you can apply the property. Position vector. F, uh, I mean dot product, F dot ROA is what? Is I dot I J times J and K times K. Oh, wait a second. Is F dot R or R dot F? What do you think? Does it make a difference? F dot R or R dot A? No, it doesn't because it's dot product. The dot product is just a multiplication of numbers. So 2 times 2 is the same thing as saying 2 times 2. It doesn't matter in what way you do it. So we calculated the dot product in this way. Now, we know also that the dot product, which we already know, is the magnitude of A times magnitude of B, uh, the other vector, times cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Do we know this? Yes, we just calculated. Do we know this? Well, we calculated before. Do we know this? Yes, we calculated before also. The only unknown is what I'm looking for, which is the cosine of the angle. Then I just put all the values in the equation and solve for cosine, get the inverse and get the angle. First part, done. The other question is how much of that force is acting over the pole? Well, let's do it. The only thing that I have to do is get the force and multiply the force by the unit vector in the direction of the pole. Force times the unit vector in the direction. And this works for everything, guys. When we do moments later and they ask you what is the moment about an axis, it's the same thing, it's applying dot product. So I need the unit vector in the direction of the pole. In the direction of the pole, the unit vector, I know the, I calculated before the position vector, 2, 2, negative 1, and I calculated before the magnitude, which is this one. And then I'm going to dot multiply the force times the unit vector. Force is this times the unit vector. That means that it's going to be this times this, this times this. Remember, this is two thirds because it's two thirds. And this times this, which is negative one third. That's why you have the negative one third here. And then you get the force acting on that pole. Now, pay attention to this because it can save you time. And time are points if you're taking a test. The other definition of the unit vector is what? Magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between the two points, between the two lines, the two vectors. Do we know the magnitude of the force? Yes, we do. How much is the magnitude of the force? We calculated before, magnitude of the force is 10.95. Now, second question. Do we know the magnitude of the unit vector? Yes, we know. How much is the magnitude of the unit vector? One. Do we know the angle between the force and the unit vector OA? Yes, we do know the force also, the, the angle also. How much is the angle? We calculated. It's 86.5. Now, do it in the calculator and prove it. 10.95 times cosine of 86.5. And that's going to give you, maybe it's going to give you here 0 0.666 or 0 0.668. But that's just because of the rounding errors that we have. But you can do it in this way, or you can just say force multiplied by the uh, cosine of the angle, and that's going to be the projection that we have done before every time that we use triangles. Okay, let's finish with that attention quiz. The dot product can be used to find all of the following except sum of the two vectors, angle between two vectors, component of a vector parallel, component of a vector perpendicular. Well, actually, the sum of two vectors is not calculated using dot product. If P and Q are two points in the 3D space, how are the positions of RPQ and RQP related? Come on, guys, we're finishing. Wake up.
they are equal and opposite. If a dot product of two non-zero vectors is zero, you know something? I'm gonna ask you this question in class personally because you are already sleeping. So I wanna ask you this concept quiz next time. This is all for today. Now pay attention once again. Next class, I'm gonna be with you. And I like to receive my students with a quiz. I might do it or I might not do it. But that's gonna be up to me, not up to you. So far, we have covered in two lectures a lot of material. I hope that you go review and practice because the first thing before saying, hello guys, how are you doing? That I can do next class is say, hello guys, how are you doing? Did you study? Well, let's verify it, let's check it out. And then I will do a quiz or a class activity or something that worth points. And I don't want you losing those points. So be, be prepared, please be prepared. Have a nice weekend and I'll see you hopefully next class. Bye-bye guys.